Hello. Welcome to office hours. Uh, we'll get started in a minute or two when we let people have a chance to log on. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday. Um, I will uh, start by wishing everybody, uh, hope everybody's healthy and happy and um, staying sane. Um, I'm doing my best. Um, I will also start by showing you today's astronomy picture of the day, because why not? There you go. Um, so cool foreground and background images here. In the foreground, you've got a Swiss Alpine ski lodge. Um, actually, this is the top of a mountain and you can see actually the ski uh, lift cables coming down in this direction. Um, and you can see the tracks that skiers have made coming down this particular slope. Looks pretty amazing. Um, in the background, you have the Andromeda Galaxy, one of our favorite images from the entire semester. Um, uh, the cool thing about this image, obviously this is not a single exposure. There's no way to get this much detail in a background image and this much detail in a foreground image, which have very different brightnesses in a single shot. But it was taken by the same person at almost the same time with the same lens pointed in exactly the same direction. So if you could have enough eyesight depth of field to be able to see both amazing detail in faint things and foreground things that are much brighter, it would look something like this. That is actually how big Andromeda Galaxy looks against this particular thing from the distance that this guy was taken from. So it's a pretty amazing picture. All right. Um, so uh, maybe I'll, I've done all that stuff. I'll, I'll just open up to questions. We've got 40 minutes. Go ahead. What you got? Um, I had a question for the practice test. I have like a bunch of questions actually. All right, lay them on me. Let's do it. Um, number six, I just wasn't sure. All right, let me bring it up. Okay, and the first step of the proton-proton chain, two protons come together and are captured into a single nucleus. Which of the following is not produced in this reaction? All right, let's do with the actual reaction. Um, Everything was paused. Why did that happen? Okay, there it is. So the proton proton chain has three steps. The first step is see if I can do this proton and proton come together. Nuclear fusion happens. And out the back end comes a nucleus that has a single proton and this is going to be a pain in the butt a single neutron. Let's call the red ones neutrons. Right? Now, um, if we were writing this out, I'm going to go back to black now. Um, this would look like a hydrogen one nucleus. Ah, no, that's not what I want. Hydrogen one nucleus and a hydrogen one nucleus come together and go to this thing that also has a proton and a neutron. That thing is also a hydrogen nucleus, but it's a hydrogen two nucleus or a deuterium nucleus. Now that can't be the whole story because we've violated charge conservation. There's plus two at the beginning and, and plus one in the other side. So we need another particle that comes out of here that has a positive charge. That thing is an, a positron. Positrons, as you may remember, are anti-electrons. They are exactly the same mass and everything as an electron except they have positive charge instead of negative charge. This is a, an anti-particle. It will immediately find 
the nearest electron to it and annihilate it, and both of the masses will be converted directly in energy. That also can't be the only thing that happens because a positron has lepton number and there's zero lepton number on the, in the left, and now there's, po there's negative lepton number on the right. So we need something that has a positive lepton number also to come flying out of here, which is a neutrino. Um, so uh, those are the things that happen in the first step of the proton-proton chain. Two protons come together, two bare protons come together to create a helium-2 nucleus, a positron, and a neutrino. Let's go back to the question. So the answer would be B then? Uh, sure, if you remind me what B is. Um, a helium-3 nucleus? That's right. That's the, um, the helium-3 nucleus would be the product of the second step of the, of the proton-proton chain, which is take that deuterium nucleus, bang it with another proton, and you get out a helium-3 nucleus plus a gamma. And then take the three of those. The third step is taking three of, two of those helium-3 nuclei and combining them together to make a helium-4 nucleus and two protons. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure, Jenna. What's up? Um, so like on the exam that we have to take, like yep. between today and Sunday, um, yep. are we gonna have to do something similar to like the last kappa for questions one through four? <laughs> uh, it won't be anything that complicated. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a question on um, the Kappa. I like got the first question, but like yeah, two through four, I've like been having trouble with. And like I opened the table and the textbook and everything, but I still haven't yeah, gotten the right combination. They're confusing. Let's let's open it up. I should probably reword these or make it a little less confusing. But okay, here's the Kappa. Um, so uh, number two is confusing simply because it's not necessarily obvious, although it says it way up here, that these spectra in the first image are OBA of GKM. These are in, in, in temperature order. So the hottest is at the top and the coolest is at the bottom. Um, that certainly helps for two. Once you know which is which, oh, okay. getting one and two together uh, probably makes a difference. Um, three is tricky because they don't want you to use the OBA of GKM. I should probably just do that. They instead want you to use the letters from the bottom picture on the left. So once you figure out, I mean, I would, I would, if I were doing this, just make a little table. O star is D and the B star is E or whatever it is. And then, and then you can um, hopefully, because you should be able to, from the table, figure out number one corresponds to which spectral type. They're, not a perfect correlation, but they're close enough that you can probably figure it out. And then once you know that, you just have to figure out, okay, if let's say five is the, the M star, I don't know if it is, and A is the M star over here, you just have to know that the fifth one is gonna be um, spectrum A down here. So um, I don't know if that's helpful, but um, to make a table of the O star is A and the B star is D or whatever it is, um, will be helpful in solving number three um, and four. Oh, okay, I, probably should have asked, I probably should have asked four first because getting four actually helps with three. Mm -hmm. Does that help, Sarah? Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. Well, can I talk about the practice? Because sure. Go ahead, Ryzen. Um, Number 11, was the answer just sunspots or was it all of the above? I couldn't get a... All right. Let me see. Oop, that's not the one. Dang it. I'm still bad at this. Number, which one did you say? 11? 11. Ah, um, which observations characterize solar maximum? Yeah, was it just sunspots? Um, it is just sunspots. Okay. That's right. All the rest of them don't happen during the solar cycle. That's right. Okay. There are things that happen in the solar cycle, the more magnetic fields, but none of them are actually listed here. Yep. Um, number 13. If we were to take stellar parallax measurements of a star, oh, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. I actually like this question a lot. Um, sometimes you come up with questions that are just really good. This one's one. Okay. 
Um, if you take a telescope, parallax measurements of a star from a telescope situated on Mars instead of the Earth, the parallax angle would be larger. Oh, usually I ask what would happen to the parallax angle, and that's a harder question. Is it because of the atmosphere? It's not because of the atmosphere. That's a good guess, though. The, um, what's different about Mars that would cause it to um, have a larger parallax angle? Let's, let's draw a picture. What is parallax? How does it happen? Um, parallax, as you... Let's draw the picture. Um, if you have a nearby star, there's a nearby star. Here is the Earth. Uh, here's the sun. And here's the Earth going around the sun, right? So parallax is the fact that we see this star in a different place on one side of the sun's, on the Earth's orbit, and a different place on the other side, right? This, this nearby star will actually seem to move with respect to background stars. What is different about Mars in this picture? We haven't talked about Mars, but um, so maybe the reason I made this a little easier. Mars has a different orbit. It's not at the same place as the Earth is, right? What does Mars's orbit look like? It's further away. So Mars's orbit looks like this. It takes longer to go around the sun, but Mars has a better baseline for actually observing these parallax angles. And so Mars's thing will be same star, same distance away, you'll get a larger parallax angle simply because the baseline for Mars's orbit is bigger than the baseline for Earth's orbit. I hope that was one of the answers. I was wondering about number five on the homework. Oh, so it's D. It's D. Mars has a large orbit radius in Earth. That's right. Some number five on the homework? That was yeah, number five. Let's take a look. Let me see. Ah, all the struct statements concerning spectral classes of stars. Okay, hydrogen lines are weak in O stars because most of the lines are most of most of the ionized. K star is dominant. Okay. Um, is there a particular one you were confused about or um, had questions about or um, um, want to go over all of them? Well, I was wondering about um, the oh, be a fine guy girl kiss me for a mnemonic yep. because like we added L, T, and Y. We did. So, we did. Okay. Um, L, T, Y are rarely used though and they are okay. only for non-stellar objects like brown dwarfs. Um, so D is certainly true. It is certainly a mnemonic, mnemonic for me remembering the, the majority of the commonly used spectral classes. So that's definitely a true one. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's do some, talk about some general things that might help. Um, remember that OBAFGKM is obviously not in any alphabetical order for things that are physical, right? But it is an alphabetical order of something that is observable namely the strengths of the hydrogen lines. A stars have the strongest hydrogen lines. B stars have the next strongest hydrogen lines. O and M stars have very, very weak hydrogen lines. And so that's gonna help you out from, uh, why is that? Um, well, A stars, again, are kind of in the hot range of stars, but as you go hotter, remember how this, let me back up my, uh, so remember the energy spectrum diagrams of hydrogen or any element. Um, you've got these energy levels um, and hydrogen and, and electrons can only exist in these, ah, dang it, in these particular energy states. The hydrogen lines that we see in the visible part of the spectrum are all Balmer lines, which means they are created by an atom and the n equals two getting bumped up to a higher energy level. These are all Balmer lines that we can see in the visible part of the spectrum. Oh, dang it. Wow, that was bad. Oh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. Um, so, if star, why, why, so why does the hydrogen, why do those Balmer lines peak in, in the A stars? Well, they're, cool, they're, they're, they're fainter, they're weaker for cooler stars because all of those stars will be in, have their electrons in the ground state. And those lines can't form if those electrons are not in the n equals two state. For O stars, it's so hot that um, those electrons are all basically ionized. They're free. 
Um, so again, there's no electron sitting there in the n equals two state ready to absorb one of those photons and make that absorption. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, again, that doesn't solve all of them probably. Let's go back and look at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that actually will help from almost all of them. So that'll get you there, hopefully. Thank you. Yay. Um, okay. okay, other questions on homework or practice midterm or? Um, practice exam number 15. <laughs> Practice exam number 15. Yeah. I think the answer is six, but I'm just not sure. Wow. Yeah. This is one you sort of just had to remember. What is the magnitude of the faintest object that can be seen with an assisted eye? The answer is six. Yep. I just had to remember that one. Um, 10 is sort of the binocular limit. 30 is like the limit of the Hubble Space Telescope. Zero is one of the brightest stars in the sky. So, uh, you know, there are a, few, a couple of stars, a handful that are brighter than zero. But most stars in the sky that you can see fall between zero and six. And six only you can see on a very dark night away from any lights when you have really good vision. That's sort of the limit it's possible to see. Uh, from Geneseo's campus, you're probably looking at like four or five as a maximum that you could see. But six is the theoretical limit. Yep. Okay. And um, 16, is that spectroscopic binary? Right. Uh, which of the following? Oh. Is given to a pair of stars we can determine origin by observing the system. No, it's not. Spectroscopic binaries are when we're looking at um, actually stellar spectra, and as one star is moving towards us, um, its spectral lines will get blue shifted, and at that same time, the other star will be moving away from us, and its spectral lines will be red shifted, and then in another part of the orbit that will be exactly the opposite when the other one's moving towards us and the first one's moving away from us. And if you actually look at a spectrum and a, and a particular absorption line, and if these stars are moving fast enough, you'll actually see those spectral lines move back and forth as these two stars orbit one another. Um, and you can see um, that periodically, one star will be blue shifted and then red shifted and blue shifted and red shifted, and the other one will go exactly in the opposite direction. Um, so that's a spectroscopic binary. A visual binary is one where you can actually see both, um, both stars separated and watch them go around. Um, together, a double star is not a binary system at all. It's just two stars that are appear close together on the sky, um, and uh, and aren't actually in a binary system. Eclipsing binary is the one where um, you're seeing a single star, but you know it's a binary because one is passing in front of the other, and the entire thing gets a little bit fainter when that happens. Oh. And then on the other side, the other one will pass in front of the first one, and you'll get another little dip in the light curve. And if you're watching the um, the brightness of the star. It will get fainter for a brief time as, as those eclipses happen twice, usually twice every orbit. So that's an eclipsing binary star. Can we go over number 33? On the practice? Sure. Yeah. Right. So um, this is, uh, if, you, if you watch the, um, the video that I showed in one of the lectures from Tuesday, I actually show a video of a 50 solar mass cloud uh, collapsing due to its own gravity. Um, so go ahead and watch that. I can't remember which video it's on. I think number three, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, so it's, it's cool. You have this huge 50 solar mass um, cloud that they, perfectly spherical, they just gave it some um, initial tweaks so that it wasn't perfectly symmetric. And then, and then they just let it evolve put in the physics of gravity and pressure and all that stuff. And what they found, I mean, you should watch it, um, all sorts of crazy interesting things happen, but the answer is that many stars are made with varying masses and less massive stars are more common. So the answer is B. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 31. Yeah, uh, again, this is something that we went over in, um, in the last lectures, one of them, maybe three. Um, that's okay, you can take a look. Um, uh, I, showed, I showed two images of that, um, one of which is uh, 
a visible light image of the of a region and there's a just a big dark cloud in the middle of the of the image um, and then I switch to the, exactly the same image taken in the infrared and you can see a bright baby star right in the middle of it um, so infrared light is able to pass through these cloud dark clouds where these protostars are forming much more easily than visible light can for the same reason that blue light the sky is blue actually um, because the dust particles in these in these stellar <coughs> clouds and in the sun and in the atmosphere um, reflect ref, um, scatter blue light more preferentially than red light. So the, the longer the wavelength, the easier it is for these uh, wavelengths to pass through. Um, so infrared is actually the way to go. Um. 24. 24. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, you got three, four clusters here, um, all of different age. And you can tell they have different ages because they have different main sequence turnoffs. So if you look at um, the, let's say, cluster D, you know lots of stars on the main sequence still. Um, the stars in the upper left are the hot, <coughs> massive stars. They're luminous, very highly luminous. They're um, burning energy very quickly. Uh, and the stars at the lower left are the very low, or the lower right are the lower, low mass, cool, dim stars, right? These stars in the upper left lead very short lives. So D must be a very young cluster because these guys are still on the main sequence. And the main sequence turnoff is very blue in the B stars in this case. And the main sequence tel turnoff tells you how old, rel relatively how old these clusters are. D must be the youngest, B must be second youngest because its turnoff is in the F stars, and then A because its turnoff is in the G stars, and then C because its turnoff are in the K stars. Um, so you can tell based on where that main sequence turnoff is what the relative ages of all of these clusters are. Um, that gives you 24, 25 is a little bit trickier um, which of these clusters must be 10 billion years old? Here you had to know one other fact, and that other fact was that um, there is a certain star that you probably know that has a specific age of, meaning main sequence lifetime of 10 billion years, and that is the sun. The sun's main sequence lifetime is 10 billion years. It should last from beginning to end on the main sequence 10 billion years. So if you can find a cluster where the sun is just leaving the main sequence, then that cluster must be 10 billion years old. And look at that, one of those clusters does have the sun, a star with a G spectrotype and a solar a one solar luminosity, that is the sun right there, just turning off the main sequence. So cluster A must be 10 billion years old. Cluster C must be older, B and D must be younger. Jordan asked us to go over nine in the homework. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. I have a, um, I actually have a video on how to do nine, eight and nine. These are the, these are the gravity ones. Um, uh, so for nine, uh, so I don't wanna, we, we've only got about 15 more minutes on this video chat, so. Let me refer you, Jordan, to the video that I already made on eight and nine that are posted on how to do these. It's a density, uh, density equals um, mass divided by volume problem. In number eight, I give you the, 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 the radius and the density. In number nine, I give you the density and the mass and ask you to solve for the radius. Um, so it's just turning this around and, uh, and solving, for, solving for this radius in terms of, um, uh, the other things that I've given you. Um, if you have specific questions, you can you can send me an email. Can you good? go over number twelve on the homework? Sure. Thanks. Uh, suppose two protostars form at the same time, one with the mass five solar mass, and another the ten solar masses, which are the following statements are true. Okay. So I mean it would be helpful. This is figure twenty one point two twelve from the book. You might go and look at it because it actually tells you what each of these masses are and it gives you some more information. So that's gonna be helpful. Um, okay. But it really is looking at this diagram, right? Um, 
Well, uh, the one thing I'll tell you is that orbiting the Milky Way galaxy has nothing to do with how massive these stars are. Um, so, um, oh, cool. So, I don't know. I don't know which one that is for you, but that one's definitely not true. Um, lit. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, uh, but um, so so the other things are just looking at which is the ten solar mass and which is the half solar mass, and thinking about how they're changing. One of them is changing more in temperature. One of them is changing more in luminosity as they move towards the main sequence. They're vastly different time scales. This guy's up here um, go, at, go through everything much faster than these guys down here do. Um, and so uh, I think that fact with going and actually looking at this diagram from the book and seeing which matches which um, and what the time scales, actually the time scales are on here. That's, that's, so this is 10,000 years for this star to go from here to here. A half solar mass star, which I think is this one, is 10 billion years, 100 billion years, just to get to the main sequence, not even to the main sequence. So time scales are drastically different on all of those. <coughs> okay. Well, cool, thanks. Yep. Number four on the homework. I, I don't know if you did it before I logged on, but could you go over one? Number one on the homework? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. I've, I've talked about two and three a little bit. Um, one and four are similar. Um, so uh, all of these are, the confusing thing is, 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 well, for number one, it is just trying to match which of these graphs line up with all of these. And so the things you're looking for are, you know, for this top one, for instance, um, th there's, there's a line there that doesn't appear in any of the other ones, right? And there's a fairly smooth continuum. Um, so you're just looking at, obviously, this G spectrum here is going to be one of these four down here because there's lots and lots of lines. You're just trying to um, match up how these look from up here. The other thing you can do is the, is the widths of these are somewhat different. You can sort of see this one has large wings because these lines are so broad and there's some fuzziness next to all of them. So you know, if you're trying to decide between C and B, well, which one has the broader wings, right? Which one has the larger, broader spectral lines in that particular region? Um, so that's going to help you. And, and the other confusing thing about one is, you know, number one is spectrum four, right? So you're going to go up here to the very top, one, two, three, four, check out spectrum four, and you're going to match up whichever letter down here agrees with spectrum four up, up there. So it's, it's jumbled and mixed up and confused, um, which I apologize for, but it's a matter of just matching these to these and then putting them in the right order as they're listed down here. Um, and then you put in the letter, correct? And then you put in the letter, A, B, C, D, E, or F, or G, corresponding to that one, that's right. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I, if I were doing this, I'd probably do four next. Um, this is O, B, A, F, G, K, M up here. These are in order. So once you know what's, what's what down here, you should be able to match up and say which is OBA of GKM because these are just in order OBA of GKM in, in, in picture one. So I would make a table at that point. Okay, let's say um, spectrum, I don't know, D corresponds to an O star. Make a table so that that's obvious because you're gonna need that for two and three um, because uh, once you have the order, uh, all of two, both two and three um, want you to put in A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. <laughs> And so knowing which of those correspond to which of the spectral type is going to be helpful for, for solving two and three. That's the hint I'll give you. And, and 17.2 in the text is extraordinarily helpful. That will tell you sort of which of these line up with OBA of GKM. And then once you have this table set, it should be pretty easy to then correspond with which letter that, that corresponds to over there. That's my advice for one through four. Can I give some extra advice? Sure. It's actually 17.3 on the online text. Is it really? Yeah. That's so weird. Did they add it? Yeah. They must have added a table. I don't know, maybe. Maybe I'll but. just put that in the All right. I, here's what I'll do. I'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll actually upload the uh, a PDF of the table to the uh, to the Canvas assignment so that it's obvious. What's what? <clears throat> All right, we got about 10 more minutes. What else do you guys want to go over? Uh, have you gone over eight or nine? Oh, wait, you have. Sorry. Right. 
right? Yeah. Uh, eight or nine. I, yeah, we did a little bit. Um, also, I posted a video on how to do eight and nine to um, right, yeah. do, do something on there. So um, yep. if you have follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer them. But um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go over the first um, mm. video. Okay. Sorry. Well, it wasn't actually in the office hours. I actually posted a homework help page and a little little video where I explained how to do eight and nine. Do you know like what units eight winds up being in? Because I kept getting the units wrong. Uh, it'll be in kilograms. In kilograms? Okay. Yep. It should be in kilograms. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And nine should come out in meters, and then you're going to have to convert to light years. Okay. <clears throat> Um, 19 and 20 on the process exam. Sure. <clears throat> Which of the following has the highest luminosity? Yeah, this one, this one's probably the trickiest on the whole exam. Um, so uh, you don't know, again, li highest luminosity, you know from what's given in the problem how bright they appear from Earth, right? That's apparent magnitude. The smallest number, Arcturus is the brightest, followed by Rigel, and then Procyon, and then Betelgeuse. Um, and so uh, the parent magnitude tells you how bright they are from Earth. They don't tell you the luminosity. In order to get the luminosity, you need to know what the absolute magnitudes are. Um, and I don't give you the absolute magnitudes, but I give you enough information that you can calculate the absolute magnitudes. Let's do this real quick. Um, the formula of, in, of uh, Oh, it occurs to me I didn't put a formula sheet on the on the online exam. I'll I'll, I'll change that. It just occurred to me. You can use the, you can use anything you want, though, so it's not that big a deal. Anyway, um, the distance modulus formula is the one that is relevant in this case. Um, let me share my whiteboard. There it is. So what is the distance minus formula? Absolute apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude is equal to five times the log of the distance minus five. Um, and so the, uh, the general procedure is to, um, let me go back to the other thing. Um, the general procedure is to take each one of these stars plug in the apparent magnitude and the parallax angle. The parallax angle will give you the distance because distance is one over parallax angle. Plug the distance in and the apparent magnitude and you get the absolute magnitude. If you, you have to do that four times, you'll get four absolute magnitudes and the one with the smallest absolute magnitude will be the most luminous. So that was a, that one was gonna take you a while. You had to actually do the math. Unless you sort of understand how this works because which of these, Rigel, Betelgeuse, Arcturus, or Procyon, is the furthest away? Rigel. Right, because it has the smallest parallax angle. Rigel is also the second brightest from Earth of all of these. So you, if you just look at the numbers and say, hey, Rigel's the, close, the furthest away, and it looks the brightest, it must be the more luminous than Betelgeuse and Procyon. You can probably not even, if you understand how this works, not even bother with Procyon and Betelgeuse. You know it must be Rigel or Arcturus if you understand how distance and bright, apparent brightness and luminosity work. Um, the other thing is, uh, um, well, I think it ends up being Rigel because these are fairly similar apparent magnitudes. These look fairly similarly bright in the sky, but Rigel's way further away, and therefore it must be way more luminous. So you can, if you understand all this stuff, probably not even do any math at all, and understand that it has to be probably Rigel. And you asked about 20 also? Yeah. Suppose you see two main sequence stars of the same spectral type. Star one is dimmer in apparent brightness than star two by a factor of 100. What can you conclude? Um, right. So the luminosity, mirror, more distant, more distant, 10 times more distant. Again, um, right, the, how bright a star appears relates both to its luminosity and its distance. It doesn't relate at all to the spectral type, unless it's on the main sequence and you can do some sort of, some, some sort of correlation there. 
So um, in fact, in this case, without knowing the distance of the stars, you can't draw any conclusions about how their luminosities compare to one another. You have no idea what their luminosities are. It could be that the brighter one, that they're the same distance and the brighter one really is more luminous. It could be that the brighter one is just a heck of a lot closer to us and they have the same luminosity. There's no way to just to, um, um, that's ambiguous. There's no way without knowing the distances, which is which. Thank you. Okay, we've got five minutes left. What else do you want? I guess I'll ask 27 on practice exam. Okay, let's do it. Which of the following is not true of stars in a cluster? Okay, um, they all have the same age? Yep. They all have the same mass? Nope. They all have the same initial composition of the elements? Yep. They all have the same distance? Yep. So it's, it's B, they, all, they do not all have the same mass. In fact, what is, here is a cluster, an HR diagram of all these cluster stars. The ones at the top have very high mass, the ones at the very bottom have low mass, but they all have the same age, they all have the same distance, and they all have the same motion. So it's, it's B. Okay. Could you go over 12, 13? On the practice midterm? Yes. <clears throat> sure. Which following statements about apparent and opposite magnitude is true? A star with an apparent magnitude is brighter than one with a star, a star with an apparent magnitude of two. That's true. The lower the number, the brighter it appears. A star's absolute magnitude is the apparent magnitude of it were distance of 10 parsecs from Earth. That is true. That's the definition of, a, of an absolute magnitude. Um, the absolute magnitude of a star is another measure of luminosity. That is true. The magnitude system is how we use now is based on a system used by the ancient Greeks over 2,000 years ago that classified stars for how bright they appeared. That is true. Um, so it must be E, all of the above are true. And 13 you asked about? Yes. If we were to take stellar parallax measurements of a star, oh yeah, I did this one already um, today. Uh, the answer is, I'll go back to the picture we drew. Um, it is, uh, I, you don't see it. Um, um, this is the very bad picture I drew, but here is a um, nearby star um, showing the, par the, the parallax that we get from Earth. Since Mars has a larger orbit than the Earth does, it has a longer baseline, and so you get a larger um, parallax angle from Mars. So it would be D, you're saying? Uh, let me bring it back up. Um, it would be D, Mars has a large orbit by distance. Yeah, that's right. All right, we're less than a minute. Um, I will, if you have other questions, you can email me. Um, good luck on the, on the midterm. Um, don't stress too much about it. It's open book, open note. Um, I think you'll be all right. Um, uh, stay healthy and safe and away from everybody else. And um, good to see you guys. I'll, we'll do it again next week. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat>